Today I've set up a massive bracket featuring every team from 2013, where all 126 teams have a chance at winning this playoff. Each college has been placed in alphabetical order, so we'll get some crazy first round matchups like Texas versus Texas A&M, and leave in the comments who you think will win the biggest college football playoff ever. The first two teams to take the field are Air Force and Akron, and to decide which college gets home field advantage, I'll be flipping this coin. Now I will say there weren't many notable throwback players in this game and it was never close, so when that happens, we'll just go on to the next matchup quickly. I'm definitely curious about how AJ McCarron and the Crimson Tide will do, and with a backfield of TJ Yeldon, Kenyon Drake, and Derrick Henry, it's no question that they went out and put Arizona football in their place. Arizona State and Arkansas are up next, and I don't think I'm going to show the coin flip for every matchup because that'll get repetitive. Arizona State is heavily favored in this one, and even though Arkansas freshman tight end Hunter Henry caught two touchdowns, it wasn't enough. They'd end up losing by 18 to the Sun Devils, and even though Army normally does well in dynasties, if they don't pick up this fourth and three, they're going to be eliminated, but they do, and that was nice and all, but they still ended up losing. None of our first four games featured any close finishes, and Auburn versus Ball State probably won't be any better, but surprisingly, with two and a half minutes remaining, Ball State is driving on Auburn, and they're only down by seven. Now, they do need to pick up this fourth and six if they want to stay in it, and they can, but I didn't think it would be this hard for Nick Marshall and Trey Mason to get a win over the Cardinals. This Baylor-Boise State game next should be fantastic as well, so we're going to see who the home team will be, and it's going to be the Broncos. Well, it's been about three quarters, and Jay Ajayi still hasn't found the back of the end zone, and I thought because of that, quarterback Joe Southwick might carry the load, but he couldn't, so Bryce Petty and the Bears are going on to the next round. In our next matchup, Andre Williams and the Eagles made it look easy against the Falcons, so we have still yet to see an upset result, but maybe Buffalo can do that here at home. With two and a half minutes remaining, I'm surprised to say they're up by four, and they're in a position where they could go up by two possessions if they get into the end zone, which they do. This is crazy because this BYU offense has Jamal Williams and Taysom Hill on it, and at the end of the day, they were only able to come up with 10 points on the Bulls' defense. We finally got an interesting result, but I would have liked to see more of Taysom Hill. And I don't know what's going on with these Mac schools because Cal is on the brink of elimination. Jared Goff is their quarterback, but he's only put up 20 points on Central Michigan's defense. And the only reason I'm going to cut him some slack is because he is a freshman on this roster. They did pick up a huge fourth and six, though. So the dream of winning the massive playoff is still alive. And what a throw from Jared Goff. Cooper Rush, who had a short stint with the Cowboys at some point in the last few years, is Central Michigan's quarterback. And it looks like he wants nothing to do with overtime as he's moving the ball down the field pretty well. But for some reason, he's let the clock run down to two seconds, one second. This will be the final snap of the game. I don't know what he was thinking. They could have taken a field goal. He throws it to the end zone and they still get in. I cannot believe that he just won them the game like that. And this is the exact reason why we do these big tournaments. No matter who hosts this next one, I think Cincinnati's in a bit of trouble, but they are getting the home field advantage. And it didn't make a lick of a difference as Todd Boyd and Sammy Watkins ate this Bearcat defense alive. The Tigers will definitely be one of the favorites to win it all. And now we're going to get a rivalry game, which should be very good. Well, even 10 years ago, it looks like Colorado wasn't very good at football. They're going to lose to Colorado State. And now we're getting a clash between two of the best basketball schools. With about a minute left, because of Jamison Crowder's three touchdowns for the Blue Devils, UConn is trailing by 12, but they are going to escape a tackle here and maybe they can get some points. Even if they get in, they're going to need to recover the onside kick to have a chance, but it's not out of the question as they do. And it all comes down to this, who will be moving on? Duke is going to recover and they'll be able to run out the clock. After that, I have to point out that East Carolina is very lucky because since we have 126 teams, two random colleges get a first round bye. Eastern Michigan or FAU would have probably greatly appreciated that. And if FAU can recover this onside kick, they're going to secure their win, which they are able to do moving on to the next round. I think we all know that FIU in Florida is probably going to be a blowout. But with about three minutes left, somehow FIU is only down by 14. They're probably not going to score as it's already third and 16. But it was much closer than we thought it would be. And why are they punting on fourth and 12 here. They have pretty much just given up, letting the Gators win. They'll end up playing the winner of this next one, which features Florida State, and I'm almost certain that they won the championship the game this year was released. Jameis Winston and Kelvin Benjamin are on this team, but there's a couple names on Fresno State you might recognize. Not only do they have senior Derek Carr, but they also have sophomore Devontae Adams, and I was hoping that they would put up a fight, but Devontae Freeman has been just way too good. He put the team on his back with this stat line, and I can't wait to see which of these Florida teams wins the matchup in the next round. For now, though, we have to watch Georgia beat up on Georgia State, and pre-injury Todd Gurley had a field day running the ball against the Panthers, as he's going to break away for another big one, this one going for like 30, so it's no surprise that Georgia moved on, and they'll play the winner of this one next. Well, we are finally going to have a tight finish, as with a minute remaining, Hawaii has the ball trailing by six, moving down the field, and we have been waiting for a game like this to happen. Their quarterback is a lefty, he is slinging it, but because his receivers don't seem to know how to catch, they're now stuck on a fourth and eight, he has to help them pick this one up, he's throwing it off his back foot, and that's a dodge. 
why. How did he make that throw off balance? I will never understand how this game works, but the triple option Georgia Tech team now has to pass the ball down the field. And instead of burning one of their three timeouts, they went in hurry up mode. It's already down to under 15 seconds. Their quarterback's taken off. They do need to get in field goal range and it's possible, but it's not very likely when you're lined up in formations like this. They sling it over the middle. It's incomplete. And Vadley, who I've never heard of before until today, is going to have to throw it up to the end zone on the last play and it's over. Hawaii was 16 overalls worse, but they're still advancing. And I hope this coin flip lands on the bottom team because I want to see Idaho Stadium. There's a very slim chance that they actually take down Houston, but at least the iconic Kibbe Dome made the cut for this embarrassing blowout. Not that either of these teams are good, but it should be close. And with a minute and a half remaining, Indiana is trailing Illinois by seven, but they have the ball. And I didn't realize this until a second ago, but Tevin Coleman's in the backfield for the Hoosiers on this roster. So he's probably the best player out there on the field. They need to pick up this fourth and eight. He drops it. And I should have never even said anything. Indiana could technically get the ball back if they could have forced a stop on third down there, but they didn't. So the fighting Illini will be moving on. Iowa-Iowa State is also an interesting rivalry matchup, and I highly doubt that they wanted this to be their first round matchup. Well, Iowa has certainly disappointed all the kids watching from the children's hospital with this performance, and evidently their offense was just as bad back in 2013 as it is now in 2023. I apologize to my Hawkeye supporters. I do still love you all, but I just want to see some good football so I can provide you all the best content possible. If it makes you all feel any better, the Jayhawks didn't do any better as they gave up three touchdowns to Tyler Lockett, and they also let a guy named John Hubert run all over them. This is also a flashback to when my Wildcats were terrible at football, so we could be eliminated in the first round to Kent State. With about two minutes left, I'm actually surprised because Kent State has some dogs on this roster. Madden Mobile legend Dre Archer is on here, but Avery Williamson's gonna get the sack, and as long as we don't give up this fourth and 17, we'll be fine, especially because Dre Archer can't block. He might have gashed us for 131 yards, but my Wildcats have moved on to the next round, and I'm really hoping that Devontae Parker and Teddy Bridgewater get upset here. It's not looking likely because the Cardinals are at home, and that's awful for me because I think they're gonna embarrass my Wildcats in the next round. Teddy Bridgewater literally couldn't be stopped, and he made himself and Devontae Parker look good again, so I can guarantee you all I am not looking forward to this one. I think Odell Beckham Jr. is on this LSU team, and he is alongside Jarvis Landry, but for some reason Marshall is still in it. They're going down the field, and somehow Daniil Hunter, Quan Alexander, and Tredavious White can't stop this offense. There's so many NFL stars on both sides of the ball on this LSU team, but they can't stop Rakeem Cato, who takes off. And I swear, if they lose this one, it would be the upset of the century. It is third and 15, and look who is wide open. Jarvis Landry has saved the day as now they're in field goal range, but they still need to pick up this third and three, which Alfred Blue does. He's been difficult to stop alongside Jeremy Hill, who's gonna make it into the end zone, and you have to wonder if they left too much time on the board for Marshall to go down and score. Rakeem Cato needs to make something happen. It's third and five. There's 45 seconds left, but his teammates surrounding him just aren't very quality, and that's making it very hard. He did help them convert on that fourth down, though, so they technically are not out of it yet. And on third and three with 20 seconds left, he's gonna take off but get a little lost. So it'll all come down to this one final snap, most likely, and he can't get out of the pocket. I was rooting for that upset so badly, but in the end, the team of future NFL superstars has moved on. I think this Maryland Memphis one could end up being a sleeper because on paper, neither of these colleges were good, but there's one thing I missed. The greatest NFL quarterback of all time, superstar Paxton Lynch was Memphis's quarterback, and the 72 overall freshman helped his team blow out the Terrapins. If you all enjoy me using these throwback rosters, I'm 100% doing an imperialism with them, and I just love running across players that would one day end up actually making the NFL. In the Battle of the Miamis, Duke Johnson had his way. He could do whatever he wanted against the Red Hawks, and now we get the matchup that you all have probably been waiting for. This is one of those where home field advantage is very important, and Michigan State has quite the advantage. However, Connor Cook was not cooking today as he has yet to score a touchdown until this play, and unless they recover this onside kick, it's pretty much all over and they're not going to get it. I'm not sure why their quarterback, Devin Gardner, is wearing the number 98, so if any Michigan fans want to explain this one to me in the comments, that would be greatly appreciated. That Michigan-Miami game is going to be must-watch football, but at least for now, we're getting the opposite of that, but I will immediately take that back because we're going to get a close finish. Middle Tennessee State has the ball down by one with a minute and a half left, so all they need is to go down the field and get a field goal. And if they can do that, they're going to pull off the upset against Minnesota, who's a Big Ten team, at least for the next few years. But with how crazy realignment's gotten recently, we're probably going to see a super conference in the near future. They just sucked, though. And after four straight incompletions, Minnesota will most likely just run out the clock. They could get a stop here, though, and nobody seems to be able to make a tackle. That is ball game. The Gophers have made it to the round of 64, and only one SEC school will move on in this matchup. But it was back when Missouri was above average at football, 
so it didn't end up being as close as I would have liked it to be. I couldn't find anybody really notable on this Tigers roster, but Marcus Lucas went for 200 yards, and in this next one, anybody could win. It turns out that the triple option offense wasn't too effective against NC State, but I'll admit, I thought this was going to end up being a tight finish, and that's just not what ended up happening. Oh look, my Nebraska fans actually have a chance in this one. I am happy for you all. Surely the Cornhuskers won't lose at Nevada, and Amir Abdullah single-handedly carried them to the next round. He rushed for almost 200 yards, and I actually do enjoy seeing Nebraska finally have a little bit of success again. In the rivalry game that nobody was looking forward to, I wish I was joking when I say this, but with three minutes left, it is three to zero. New Mexico State has yet to get past midfield, and they finally did it, but this has been the worst matchup of all time. Both teams are terrible, and I don't know if New Mexico State is in field goal range or not, but they probably need to pick up some more yards here, and the wheel route's gonna get open for the first touchdown. I am so glad that that has finally happened, and of course, since then, the offenses have finally opened up. New Mexico's all the way down inside New Mexico State's red zone now, and all they need is about five or six more yards. I don't know if they're gonna get it, because it's already third and goal, but they've gotten themselves in a close position, and now they're gonna have a touchdown. Their kicker missed the extra point, though, so New Mexico State can win with a field goal, and I don't care if these two teams have no chance at winning this entire thing. I am invested in the result of this matchup now, and you all will be as well. New Mexico State is only getting two yards here. And they didn't use one of their three timeouts because they have one of the smartest coaches in college football, but they are still moving the ball. And with 10 seconds left and all three of their timeouts remaining, Andrew McDonald finds his guy on the drag, but it's evidently not enough to go for the game-winning field goal, so they're just going to throw it up near the end zone. And it didn't work the first time, but they're not going to give their kicker a chance. And how on earth did they just get in? I feel like this is a joke right now. And now I'm rooting for 68 overall New Mexico State the rest of the video. That was unironically the most entertaining matchup of the first round so far. And in the next one, it looks like... Like Eric Ebron's North Carolina Tar Heels are going to get the win, but the defense still needs to get one more stop, and they couldn't on the last fourth down, but they do here. We just have to hope they don't perform well against the Aggies in the next round, and somehow Northwestern is the underdog in this game. With a minute remaining, they are trailing NIU by four, and they need to go all the way down the field to score a touchdown, but that's going to be incredibly tricky for them to do because they still have a very long way to go. It is fourth and two, and they're going to go with the run to try to pick it up, which is going to work, but that was very risky, and I am surprised it paid off. Their quarterback's going to slip it and he underthrows it into double coverage. That's game. And I don't know who is on this NIU team, but I could see them stirring up some trouble. Notre Dame should end up mopping the floor with Ohio, but somehow with two and a half minutes remaining, they're going down by 10. I don't understand how this is even possible. They're like 22 overalls better than the Bobcats, but Tommy Reese did not have a good day and it ended up being 31 to 21. I don't think this result will ever make any sense to me, but MAC teams are currently on top and we're about to get a huge matchup. This is another one of those where home field advantage really really matters, and either of these guys could win the entire playoff. I gotta say, I am a bit shocked, but we're approaching a minute left, and Ohio State's down by 14. Braxton Miller is just starting to pick it up. He has had a very rough day, but they're not out of it yet. They could score a touchdown here, and they still have all three of their timeouts remaining, so if they get in, they could get the ball back, but Braxton Miller can't hit a target. He might as well just hand it off to Carlos Hyde, and that's what he's gonna do, but then the Buckeyes burned one of their three final timeouts, and Michael Thomas scores, but now they need to recover this onside kick, and instead, Sterling Shepard holds on to it. Two of the top favorites have now been eliminated in back-to-back -back games, and apparently no upset is off the table. I will admit, I was rooting for Old Dominion in this one because Taylor Heineke is their quarterback, but as you can see, he was pretty terrible, so we're gonna get the Bedlam series in the next round. Between Ole Miss and Oregon, it looks like the Ducks are gonna be the hosting team, and I'm excited for this because I'm one of the biggest Marcus Mariota fans in the world. Him and DeAnthony Thomas really got me into college football, so I'd love to see them do well in this tournament, and I'm surprised it's this close. Ole Miss does have Donta Moncrief, who just caught a touchdown, but they're going to need to get a defensive stop on the Ducks. And if they can stop the option run three times in a row, I'll be very impressed. DeAnthony Thomas is just too quick. Look at that speed on him. And one more first down will officially seal it, which Marcus Mariota is going to pick up plus more. I guess Ole Miss could score a touchdown and get the onside kick pretty quickly, but I feel like so much still needs to go their way. And Bo Wallace finds Donta Moncrief again. So I guess it's not out of the realm of possibilities, but there's only about 30 seconds left. And here we go. It'll all come down down to yet another onside kick and Oregon will recover. So Marcus Mariota is moving on to the round of 64. I have no idea who's going to come out on top of this one, but with two minutes remaining, Sean Manian's gotten his team down the field and they're going to need a first down. He's definitely fed Brandon Cooks on this drive, so I wouldn't be surprised if he looked his way, but he ended up finding another receiver. And honestly, they need to make sure that they milk some clock before they get into the end zone. You don't want to give Christian Hackenberg too much time, but now they're struggling and Penn State receiver Allen Robinson is hoping this goes badly from the sidelines. They're not going to reach the end zone. So with one first down, it's all going to be over and Christian Hackenberg's going to 
take off. With the ball in his hands, he wanted to take control of the game, and that will officially seal it. Brandon Cooks was half of the Oregon State offense, but it wasn't enough, and it looks like Pitt is the other team that gets a bye. If they hadn't have gotten that lucky, they would have been playing Purdue, but evidently the Boilermakers are no good, as they haven't scored a single point here in the fourth quarter, and they're still not gonna. If I was a Purdue fan, me personally, I would be very embarrassed by this, but hey, at least you all still have basketball to look forward to until the tournament actually starts. As for our next matchup, it is incredibly even as both teams are about an 84, but Rutgers has the home field advantage, and that must have made all of the difference as they're gonna take down San Diego State. Some of these games don't have many players that really stand out, and that's okay because not everyone can be a thriller, but SMU is trying to come back in the final seconds, and they're actually gonna catch that. If they can recover the onside kick, they could go for the Hail Mary, but they can't get the throw out, and I'm not sure why they didn't just kick the extra point there. Either way, we're gonna continue to move on, and I swear this game sim engine makes no sense most of the time. South Alabama is a 68 overall, while South Carolina is a 93 and at home, along with having the best right end in the game on their team. However, they're still struggling despite having players like Mike Davis and Demir Bird on their offense who would end up playing in the NFL in the future. How on earth did that receiver come down with that ball? The Gamecocks might be on the verge of getting bailed out here, but for some reason, they're not kicking it deep. They went with the onside kick, and there's no way they didn't recover it. South Alabama is choking right in front of us. They didn't even have to try to pick up first downs against Jadavion Clowney, and they were on pace to have the upset of the century, but now I don't think it'll happen. Most likely, it'll end up going to overtime, and then the Gamecocks will be able to win, and if that doesn't happen, it'll be because the Gamecocks score a touchdown instead, and Shaq Rowland is gonna break free. He's taking that to the house. So barring a last-second miracle from South Alabama, it is all over. I had so much hope that they would pull it off, but you know what? Their lefty QB is moving it down the field, and how is Jadavion Clowney not beating up on this terrible offensive line? They're gonna be able to at least do a Hail Mary, so it'll all depend on how strong their quarterback's arm is, and there's Jadavion Clowney. What a terrible idea to try to make this poor offensive lineman stop that big freak, and that's probably enough to put them out of Hail Mary range. He is gonna be able to get the throw off, but it's not gonna reach the end zone, and South Carolina survives the upset. They're gonna play the winner of Southern Miss and Stanford, which should end up being the Cardinal. No offense to Southern Miss, but they just didn't have an answer for Tyler Gaffney, who continues to run all over them, and it might have taken him 42 carries, but he ran for almost 190 yards. We are getting closer to the end of the first round, and this result doesn't make any sense at all because these teams were evenly matched up. For being completely even on paper, this was way too lopsided, and could Syracuse be a dark horse sleeper team in this tournament? I guess optimistically, anything could happen, and realistically, if Temple could actually hold on to take down Tennessee, it wouldn't be hard for the Orange to take down the Owls, and that would put them into the round of 32. This result isn't confirmed yet though, but for some reason, Tennessee is punting the ball, Robbie Anderson is gonna return it, and he's gonna be able to take it all the way to about the Tennessee 35. I don't understand why you would punt in that situation if your punter doesn't have a huge leg. Now Temple's down to the 15, and I should have known that they would pull this off because P.J. Walker is their quarterback. Between Robbie Anderson and him, this team is a little bit better than I was thinking, and he's gonna break a tackle. He's not gonna get the first, and personally, I'd think it's already over, but this is gonna seal it. This is honestly quite the upset, and sometimes I wonder if overall even matters. Potentially, the biggest matchup of the first round is coming up, though, and Texas A&M with Johnny Football and Mike Evans are gonna have home field advantage at Kyle Field, which is big. Case McCoy just hasn't been able to keep up with that offense, but I will say it's lower scoring than I thought it would be, and with 51 seconds left, he's gotten them all the way down the field, but they still need to get an onside kick to have a chance, so most likely, Texas will be eliminated right here, and that will confirm it. Money Manziel is moving on, to the next round, and he'll be taking on the winner of this game. I didn't realize that Baker Mayfield was the backup quarterback on this Texas Tech team, but evidently he needs to be the starter because I don't think this game should be this close. With about a minute left, Texas State just had the weirdest fake out of all time, and we now have a tie ball game, but there is a lot of time remaining on the clock, and Texas Tech's gonna move it. Davis Webb is back there at quarterback, and he has now had two big completions in a row, so they've set themselves up nicely to kick the game-winning field goal, but they might not even need it. I thought we might have had an upset here, but it's probably not going to happen. And on what will be the final play of the game, most likely Tyler Jones is going to get the throw off, but it's not going to go anywhere. I'm excited to see Tech versus A&M in the next round, but first, we're going to get this thriller. And I have to say, I'm impressed with how the Mac schools have taken care of business in their recent games. Kareem Hunt's actually on this Toledo team, but he's the backup, so he didn't play in that blowout win. Tulane and Tulsa is up next. And to be honest, it just wasn't a good game at all. We have a lot of mid matchups coming up, but UCF does have a player that's no and that is quarterback Blake Bortles, who has led them to an easy win. Now, to my surprise, the University of Louisiana Lafayette is in a close one with the Bruins, and instead of tying it up with a field goal, they're going for it on fourth and three, which ended up being the right decision. It was definitely
definitely risky, but it seems to be paying off pretty well for them. And if UCLA quarterback Brett Hundley can't get his team into the end zone, they're going to be upset at home. And they're down to the 25 yard line, but the clock is ticking. It is already under 45 seconds. He is taking off to the side and he fumbles the ball. His lineman picks it up down to the 10. He breaks some tackles. And that was so unorthodox, but it seems to have worked for them. And on the option run, their running back's going to break a tackle, shedding one, but he goes down. And the raging Cajuns are looking for a goal line stand, which is seeming more and more probable. It is third and goal. There's about 15 seconds left. Brett Hundley takes the snap and he's going to sail it over his wide receiver's head. So if UCLA can't pick up four yards here, it is all over, but they're going to do so. And what an effort we just saw from Louisiana Lafayette. It sucks that they weren't able to pull away in the end, but that's just how the playoffs end up working. Not many people are looking forward to this next game and UMass fans are going to be disappointed that it took their team almost four, four quarters to get onto the board. Let's just hope that UNLV puts up a fight against USC. And it actually happened. I was not expecting that, but with a few minutes left, USC is in a little bit of trouble. And Nelson Aguilar is making some catches, but they still need to find the back of the end zone. I cannot believe that they are trailing UNLV by seven, but I think they're about to get in here. And you have to wonder if the Rebels are going to choke. It's third and nine. They're not going to pick it up. So they had to give the ball back to USC. And when Cody Kessler went to sling it, he almost threw an interception. It looks like we're about to get our first overtime game of this college football playoff. But if UNLV's punter isn't very good and this ball doesn't go far, USC is going to be in field goal range. And it looks like that's exactly what's going to happen. Nelson Aguilar threw a dude off of him on that return. And now Cody Kessler is going to throw it up. And that was dropped. But it was almost a touchdown. And they probably need a few more yards, which they're going to get. So even though Marquise Lee didn't hold on to the last one, it'll be okay. Because the Trojans are going to win in the final seconds against UNLV. They'll play Louisiana Monroe in the next round. And I think this one is pre-Utah being good and pre-USF being bad. Due to that, it's actually a really close game as with a minute and a half left, USF is trailing, but their quarterback just threw a pick. So my team from Tampa needs to get a stop on third down to get the ball back. And freshman quarterback Mike White has a chance. This is far before he ever knew he'd be in the NFL. And he's only a 74 on this roster, so my expectations are pretty low, but hey, they're moving the ball a bit. And with 47 seconds left, there's still a chance we reach the end zone here. Fourth and four ended up coming up though, so this is a must pick up down. And Mike White throws a laser to the 15, to the 10, receiver breaks two tackles. And what a miracle of a drive. Utah is going to lose this game barring any last second miracles and that'll seal it. And they'll be facing off against Utah State who had their way against UTEP at home. Coming up next, Vanderbilt's going to be taking the field. And I feel like I'm tripping out because they're inside the top 25. I guess I never realized that they used to be good at football. But once I realized that wide receiver Jordan Matthews was on this team, it made a little more sense. And they'll play the winner of the Commonwealth Cup in the next round. It'll probably end up being Virginia Tech. But with a minute and a half left, they're only up by six. So it is not over yet. Virginia has the ball. And you gotta love a close rivalry finish, but that was a terrible play. I don't understand why the quarterback didn't get the ball out on the halfback screen, but on fourth and 17, they're not gonna pick it up. Wait, they did. Or did they not? It says it's a turnover. From one camera angle, it looked like the tight end caught the ball off of the deflection, but it turns out that he couldn't hold on to the ball. And Virginia Tech is gonna take down their rivals. That finish ended up coming down to the final minute. And I hope that this one does as well, which seems to be the case. Wake Forest has the ball down by six. And even though their quarterback really tried to turn it over there. They have it still. It's fourth and 12 and they are going to fall just short. So if they want to have one more chance, they need to get a stop on this third and six and they're not going to be able to do so. Washington will now play the winner of Washington State in West Virginia. And I think this is just post the Mountaineers being really good. That's probably why it's a close game against Washington State with a minute left. They're only up by four and they need a stop. But I have a feeling that they're going to be able to get it. That throw is going to go right above the corner's head. And that was a very tight window for Connor Halliday to throw the ball into, but he did anyways. And now he throws was another one, which honestly should have been held on to. Now it's third and 10. They're not going to get the first down on this play and they're going to end up on a fourth and four where they have to pick it up and they don't do it. West Virginia ends up surviving and we only have two more first round matchups remaining. The first one is Western Michigan versus Western Kentucky. And even though the Hilltoppers were 18 overalls better on paper, they simply couldn't stop freshman Corey Davis. In the other one, we're going to get Wisconsin versus Wyoming and James White is going to try to put it away here, but Wyoming has stayed persistent. They've stayed in the game and they're all the way down to about the 15 and they'd even end up scoring a touchdown But they have to recover this onside kick and wait this game is far from over That's why I always stay in it to watch the onside kick to see what happens You never know what could and the final first round matchup is ending with a thriller All they need is a field goal to send it to overtime, but with no timeouts remaining that is much easier said than done It's fourth and one they're gonna pick it up and go down to about the 40 But I doubt their kicker is gonna be able to hit it from here and go ahead and spike the ball It should not have taken Brett Smith that long, but now he just has to throw it up to the end zone on a last second prayer. It gets knocked down and Wisconsin's the final team moving on to the round.
round of 64. Our first second round matchup is going to be Air Force versus Alabama. And even with the home field advantage, I think the Falcons are in trouble. When the third string running back you're facing off against is Derrick Henry, there's only so much you can do. And hopefully this next one is a bit closer. Well, it technically was, but in the end, Arkansas State just couldn't keep up with the Sun Devils. They tried their best to. But the following matchup is between Auburn and Baylor. And this one could definitely go either way. Auburn won the privilege of hosting this one. And I expected Baylor to put up a better fight, but they trailed by two possessions the entire game. They just couldn't stop Trey Mason, who gashed them for multiple big plays. And Gabe Wright had a very good defensive performance. They'll play the winner of this one in the next round. And with a little more than a minute remaining, we have a tie game and Buffalo's moving the ball. It looks like they're just going to try to run out the clock and kick a field goal, which stinks for Boston College. But some of these Mac schools have been surprisingly dominant and the clock is going to run out because they ran out of time. I cannot believe we're going overtime right now. But the Bulls have gotten Boston College to a third and goal and they're going to stop him short. There's no way that they're taking their field goal right now. But because they did, Buffalo can win with a touchdown and that's going to come on the halfback draw. They're representing the Mac very well and maybe they'll put up a fight against Auburn. Central Michigan's also from the Mac, so anything could happen here. But on paper, they were very mismatched, especially against the Clemson Tigers receiving core. I mean, they literally have Sammy Watkins, Martavius Bryant, Adam Humphreys, and Mike Williams. So the fact that they only lost by 19 is a victory in itself. Whoever comes out on top of this one will face Clemson in the next round. And with four minutes remaining, Colorado State's going for a controversial fourth and seven, which they are not going to get. In the end, I think that's going to come back to bite them as with a minute remaining, they're now trailing by nine points and they could have used those. No matter what happens here, they're going to have to recover an onside kick to score again. And if they don't get this, then the Blue Devils are going to move on, which is what happens. The basketball school is on to the round of 32 and East Carolina got a bye. So this is the first time they're playing. I thought it might be close, but if they punch this in, it's going to be over. And now it's time for one of the matchups that you all have probably been waiting for. Obviously, this is one where I have to show the coin flip. It'll be the bottom team at home. And I'm almost positive that Jameis Winston's going to love that advantage. I'm honestly not sure if anybody's going to be able to keep up with this seminal offense, because if we're being realistic, how do you stop this? Devontae Freeman had himself a field day rushing for over 100 yards, and that seminal team is a scary one to face. As for Hawaii, I think they're going to have a hard time stopping Todd Gurley, and that's exactly how it unfolded as he kept taking it in. The winner of Houston and Illinois will have to play the Bulldogs next, and the Fighting Illini won the toss, so being at home, I thought they might cruise to an easy win, but that just hasn't been the case. They're down by three, and they really need to get into the end zone here, which Josh Ferguson does, but they also left Houston 51 seconds and three timeouts to score the go-ahead touchdown, which is definitely possible. John O'Corn has already thrown two picks today, but they've passed it 38 times to only eight rushes, so you know that he's going to sling it, and that probably should have been an interception, but the Illinois cornerback couldn't hold on to it, and on fourth and 10, the Houston Cougars are going to convert. That was clutch as you all didn't see it, but they had three straight incompletions. Now they're moving the ball down the field easily again, and they're only 10 yards away from getting into the end zone. Their quarterback's going to try to take off. John O'Corn apparently has the speed and the jukes, but he couldn't reach the end zone, so it comes down to this one final play, and he won't make it there. He tried to do it all himself, but Illinois prevailed in the end, and their reward for that is playing Georgia next. To be honest with you all, I don't even know how to pronounce the name of this rivalry game, but I think it's for Megadon, and it's for a spot in the round of 32. With two and a half minutes remaining, Kansas State is down by nine, but they went for it on fourth and goal, and they probably should have just taken their three there, but they have Iowa State on a third and 14, and they're going to get the ball back, so they're not completely out of it yet, but they wound the play clock all the way down to two seconds before this fourth and seven play, which they are going to convert, and I don't understand why their quarterback did that. He just killed like 30 seconds, but Tyler Lockett comes away with a catch there, and they're slowly moving the ball down the field. They need to do it a little bit quicker, but I guess with only one timeout remaining, they no longer have that sense of urgency as they need the onside kick. In some of these videos, we've seen them get recovered a few different times, but after taking a sack, I think it's all over. They went with a halfback draw on fourth and 17, and their running back is going to pick it up. It's a little unorthodox, but whatever they're doing is technically working, and the quarterback misses, so you have to wonder what their plan is here, because there's only 11 seconds left, and they need to get the ball back still. It is such a long shot, but they could technically pull it off still until he misses the throw, and Iowa State walks away with the win. They'll play the winner of the Governor's Cup, where I need Kentucky to win, but if we don't get home field advantage, it's probably going to be rough, and we're not going to. If I go over to the team overalls, you'll see that it is very lopsided, and barring a last second miracle, my Wildcats are going to be out. We ended up getting into the end zone there, but on the onside kick, Louisville is going to safely recover it, so it is all over, and Teddy Bridgewater has led this team to a win over Kentucky. I hate to say it, but the Cardinals just played better, and they'll probably make quick work of the Cyclones in the next round. After almost losing to Marshall, LSU has taken the field again, and it looks like they have finally found their groove as they destroyed Memphis. I'll be interested to see which of these two teams they play next, and as for home field advantage, it looks like that's going to go to Michigan. These teams literally couldn't be more 
even. But going into the fourth, Miami is up 11. And with three minutes left, Michigan really needs to score on this drive. There's a lot of time in the pocket and Devin Gardner throws an interception. Due to that, Duke Johnson has helped the Hurricanes burn through the rest of the clock as he keeps making moves. And it's clear that he wanted the win more than anybody else. LSU versus Miami is going to be a classic. But until then, we get even better ones like Missouri versus Minnesota. This one was so good that I made it all the way to the second quarter before falling asleep. And let's just go ahead and get on to the next game. I thought it could have been good, but NC State couldn't find a solution to stop Amir Abdullah. And I can't wait to see Missouri versus Nebraska in the round of 32. I'm still more stoked to cheer on New Mexico State though. And it turns out when they have to play a real opponent, it gets ugly. Andrew McDonald only completed two of his 16 passes, but the Aggies win over New Mexico will never be forgotten. As for our next game, we have a matchup between these two Mac schools. And despite being 11 overall is higher, Northern Illinois is in a bit of trouble. With about 45 seconds remaining, they're still trailing by seven and they are in the red zone, but they're on the brink of being upset. And that's not good because they're the best Mac school left. I want to see a tiny school win it all. And they're honestly our best chance. But after not getting that fourth down, it is going to be completely over. And Ohio will take on North Carolina next. Oklahoma beat Ohio State. So I would assume that they're the favorite for this, but they have to hit the road for the Bedlam game. And here in the fourth quarter, I can tell this is going to be a great finish. Damian Williams just gave the Sooners a one point lead. So Oklahoma State needs to respond back on third and 12, but they took the sack instead. And now Oklahoma has the ball, but Trevor Knight misses the throw. Due to that, the Sooners have no choice but to take the field goal. And the ball is in the hands of Clint Shelf, who has some zip behind that football. He is definitely not in a good mood. He does not want to lose to Oklahoma here at home. He is slinging it. And if the Sooners would have just capitalized on that last drive, it would all be over. But now they're going to give up a massive dot. And I should have known that Clint Shelf would have made that amazing throw. He did leave a little too much time for Trevor Knight, though, as he's going to take off and get 10. So we'll see if he can get his team in field goal range. He really doesn't need to get that many more yards. And here on third down, it looks like they're going to go with the halfback screen to Damian Williams, who breaks one tackle, but he can't break the second. So all of a sudden, it is fourth and eight. They are at the 50, and they are not going to pick it up. Kevin Peterson just made the play of the game. And even though the Sooners beat Ohio State, they've been eliminated. Most of these matchups are starting to get a lot better. And I'd love for Marcus Mariota to get the home field advantage here, which he's going to do. That's big when you're facing off against a team that has players like Allen Robinson and Adrian Amos. And apparently this was before he converted to a safety in the NFL. With less than five minutes left though, Oregon was trailing until they tied it up here. And it has been a defensive battle as nobody seems to want to score on each other. I think Penn State is going to finally break that curse though, as they've moved it all the way down the field and they're taking the clock with them too. So Oregon needs to take some timeouts. They didn't though. So there's only 12 seconds remaining. And unless DeAnthony Thomas has a miracle on this kickoff return in him, it's probably all going to be over. I was not expecting Marcus Mariota to get put out in the second round, but I guess it is what it is. And there's going to be a fumble. They're not even going to have a chance at one last play. It is done. And the Nittany Lions were just the better team. Bryce did beat Purdue, but I think they're going to struggle with Pitt. And with two minutes remaining, they're trailing by 14. So I predicted it right. And that's unfortunate because we all love a close matchup, but that just didn't happen today. The winner of Rutgers and San Jose State will get the Panthers in the next round. And despite being at home, the Scarlet Knights are going to get eliminated. It all came down to the fact that they just couldn't finish it when they got in the red zone. And between these two teams, I have no idea who is the better one. South Carolina struggled in their first game, but on paper, they are amazing. But Stanford's an even higher overall than them. So there's no telling how this one is going to go. Either way, I'm super excited for it. And with two and a half minutes remaining, Stanford has it on the goal line. But that missed throw from Kevin Hogan is going to force the Cardinal to settle for three. It only took a few plays for South Carolina to get to the other end of the field. And Mike Davis punched it in. So South Carolina is back up by four and they're going to need to get some defensive stops. What a huge sack that was right there. It is third and 12 and Stanford picks it up and they have 27 first downs to the Gamecocks 12. I don't know how they're losing, but I'm guessing they haven't taken advantage of their red zone opportunities and they need to get there again. We're going to find out how much of a difference Jadavian Clowney can make and he is getting no pressure here. So there was so much time for that throw and I think Stanford is going to get in. They are inside the 10 and Ty Montgomery is going to come down with it. So it's probably all over for South Carolina. They have a long way to go and I don't want to say that Connor Shaw doesn't have it in him, but I just don't think he does. He is taking check downs with this little time. And one of the playoff contenders who could have won it all is about to be eliminated. Mike Davis can't go anywhere, but I guess that first down does keep their hopes alive. Somebody went into motion, so they're not even going to potentially get the snap off. I don't know what they're thinking. The final play is up and he almost broke free. Stanford is lucky that they survived right there. And now they're waiting to find out who their next opponent is. With how well Syracuse played in their first game, I would say them. And PJ Walker did give his best effort for the Owls, but in the end, it just wasn't enough. And that's because his defense did stuff like this. Now we're getting another Texas rivalry matchup though. And this is one of the biggest third downs in 
the game. Johnny Manziel is going to take off, but he couldn't quite pick up the first down. So they went for it on fourth and two, and they are going to get it plus more. Texas Tech is in a bit of trouble now as they have to stop the run, and they are not showing that they are capable of doing that at all. For a second, I thought they might pull off the upset, but that's just not going to happen. And Johnny Manziel is going on to the round of 32. He'll be faced up against the winner of this game. And if they manage the clock right, it should be Toledo. But for some reason, they just hiked the ball. And I don't understand that. Are they trying to give this game away? Tulane has no timeouts left. And they just went for it on fourth and six. All they had to do was pin them back with a punt. But instead, they've given them the ball on the 30. And they're going to be able to get into field goal range. I mean, it's no guarantee. But it's a possibility that they wouldn't have had if they would have just punted it. But because of two bad throws from Tulane's quarterback, they have to go for the Hail Mary. And he chucked that ball all the way up in the air. But he also threw it too far. And it almost came down in the hands of the Tulane player. Instead of swatting this ball down, the Toledo cornerback almost just blew it there for his team. But they are moving on to the next round. And I'd imagine that Texas A&M is going to rail them. This UCLA-UCF matchup is actually really interesting because both teams are around a 90 overall. And Blake Bortles is going to get the home field advantage. That seemed to make a difference as with two minutes remaining, UCLA is down by 10 and Brent Hundley sails the pass. So they have to pick up this fourth and 10 or it is all over. And he has a ton of time in the pocket. Will he be able to deliver? No, he will not. That is intercepted. And it's actually run back all the way to the 35. Either way, in the end, Blake Bortles won with this terrible stat line. And the next team he'll face off against will most likely be USC. I mean, Louisiana Monroe did put up a good fight, better than I thought they would have, but they're still down by 14 and it is all over up to this point. Look how much time he had. And even if Cody Kessler's pass didn't result in a first down, they're going to get their three or they're not going to. And three plays later, Louisiana Monroe ended up scoring a touchdown. Their kicker missed the extra point though. And on the onside kick, they're not going to be able to recover it. So USC will play UCF next. And I'm hoping that the Bulls can pull off the miracle here in Tampa. But freshman Mike White just didn't have it in him today as it's fourth and 10 and they're going to actually pick it up. We're down 14. And even then, I just don't see a miracle comeback happening. We'll see what does happen. I mean, we're picking up some big gains, but with 25 seconds left, it is fourth and 10 and the throw is off the marks. So Utah State's moving on to the round of 32 and they'll play the winner of Vanderbilt and Virginia Tech. With a minute and a half remaining, the Commodores have the ball. They're trailing by two. All they need is a field goal. And Jordan Matthews already has two catches on this drive. They're going to probably force feed it to him, which is exactly what they're doing. They just threw another ball his way. And on this one, they found somebody else. But at the end of the day, they are moving down the field. They probably only need about 10 or 15 more yards. And Virginia Tech is on the brink of elimination. You almost want to let them score at this point, because if you don't, they're probably just going to run down the clock and take a field goal. And they're not going to reach the end zone. But Vanderbilt is running the clock down all the way to no time left. So with five, four, three, two, they just snapped the ball and they went with the run. And I don't know how they did it, but they got the timeout off. So they're going to win. That was honestly way too close for comfort. But now we get to see Washington versus West Virginia. And this is probably the last good matchup of the round of 64. Well, it turns out the Mountaineers offense struggled for most of the game. They couldn't score until the last seconds. So they're technically not out of it, but that was the worst onside kick of the video. And now it's over. Washington will play the winner of the final round of 64 game. And I just realized that Melvin Gordon was also on this Wisconsin team with James White. Both of them dominated today as Western Michigan couldn't stop the rushing attack. And with this result wrapping up the round of 32, it's time to figure out which 16 teams will make the Sweet 16. Arizona State's going to have to play really well if they want to beat Alabama, but Taylor Kelly could only do so much. So with about a minute left, they're down by 17. It's fourth and 14 and it is over. It looks like we're most likely going to get an Iron Bowl matchup in the Sweet 16, but Auburn will still need to get past Buffalo first. And that really wasn't too much of an issue for them as they have a 30 point lead with 30 seconds left and they're going to knock down that pass. The Tigers were too much for the Bulls to handle and Trey Mason had himself a pretty solid day. So I can't wait to see how this one goes in the next round, but we have to get there first. And now we have an ACC matchup. The only thing Duke has going for them is they get to host. And that has made all of the differences. Not only were they lucky on the toss, but they've also been lucky with things that have gone their way. They need to get a stop though. And you can't just let Taj Boyd do that to you and give up the two point conversion. The Blue Devils are in the process of choking if they can't run out the rest of this clock, but the halfback screen is going to create a ton of space for Juwan Thompson, who's going to go all the way down to about the five. That was massive as Duke is pretty much guaranteed to go up by two possessions here. And after punching it in with a quarterback sneak, Clemson has the ball down by 15, trying to score. But even if they do, they're going to need to get the onside kick as well. So the odds are not in their favor. But Martavis Bryant comes away with six and they're actually going for the two point conversion now, which they're going to get. So Duke could very well blow this if they can't hold on to it, but they have somebody on the hands team that's good at that. I cannot believe that they just took down Clemson, but Anthony Boone had an incredible game. And now the Blue Devils are waiting to find out their next opponent. If East Carolina can pull this off, I will be incredibly impressed. But in the end, they just didn't have what it takes. Jameis Winston led his
his team to a 21 point win and it's time to see how good Illinois really is. The fighting Illini are certainly the underdogs going into this one and it showed as the Bulldogs took them down by 38 points. Even though these round of 32 games are for a trip to the Sweet 16, most of them have been blowouts and although that trend won't remain true for this one, Iowa State is just starting to put a comeback in with a minute and a half left. This is an important two point conversion that they're not going to get and even without the onside kick, they might have had a chance if they could have picked that up but they're not going to recover. So Louisville, my least favorite team in the world is going to be one of the final 16 teams remaining and they're good. In fact, I think they might beat Georgia for a spot in the lead eight, but now we're getting two matchups that you all have probably been waiting for and home field advantage in this one is going to be very big. It's going to be the bottom team. So Miami might have a slight edge, but they're also the lower overall team, so they need it. Well, so much for this being an exciting one as the Tigers were on steroids and when both Jeremy Hill and Odell Beckham Jr. go for over 100 yards, along with Duke Johnson getting held to just six yards, it's no surprise that LSU destroys Miami and they're patiently waiting to find out who they're going to rail next. With two minutes left in that one, Nebraska is trailing by 10 and Taylor Martinez has really struggled to hit a target today along with being able to sense pressure. It's just been a rough showing for the Cornhuskers but it's not over yet as they're going to potentially get this and they could take a field goal here but they're being aggressive on fourth and one and it's going to pay off. Amir Abdullah is only rushed for 42 yards and he's going to fake them out on the read option but for some reason even with three timeouts Nebraska goes for the onside kick and Missouri is able to recover it. If they run commit three times they should be able to get the ball back but that's not a good start and if you give them the hole the Missouri running backs are going to hit them in stride but we have ourselves a third and three the running back is going in motion right now they're going to hike it it's going to be a pass and their quarterback's going to take off he's not going to get there so James Franklin coming up short is going to give Nebraska a chance it is a one minute drive on the dot and I'm so happy we finally have a close finish but I'm sure that Nebraska fans are very nervous right now they can't be taking these check downs unless they're able to pick up a first down with it because at least then it stops the clock and that's what they did on that last play see this is not a good situation for them. They're going to go down and now they have to hurry up to spike it and waste time. I get that they want to target Amir Abdullah as he's their best offensive weapon, but he is a running back and it's just a bad plan. Fourth and six now, 12 seconds remaining. I don't know why they went in bounds again, but they have a lot of time here and Taylor Martinez slings it. It's going to be knocked away. So Missouri's going to be moving on to the next round and I'm not sure how James Franklin is going to do there because beating LSU is going to be very difficult. North Carolina and Ohio is our next game, so this one might be a snooze fest, but I want to put my faith in one of the final two max schools remaining and that was dumb as the Tar Heels get themselves yet another easy win. TJ Logan's definitely been hard to stop though and Brian Renner hasn't been too bad either. They're finally gonna have to play somebody tough in the Sweet 16 though depending on who wins this and this is definitely a coin flip worth showing big home field advantage here and Penn State beat Oregon so I wouldn't be surprised if they beat the Cowboys too. With a minute and a half left Oklahoma State has the ball down by four they need to score and they might be able to do so but Clint Shelf still needs to get his team about another 50 yards and this is when he starts to show off that great arm of his. I could be wrong, but he doesn't seem like much of a scrambler. I've never seen him take off, only throw dots, and I'm a little surprised that they're taking timeouts because that's just going to give Penn State some time if they score. I guess they must trust their defense to force a big turnover or something as they're going to get all the way down inside the five, and there's still over 40 seconds left. I'm sure they're going to probably get into the end zone within the next couple of plays. Too much time back there in the pocket, and we have ourselves a tie ball game, which could go to overtime if Penn State can't get in field goal range, but I just have a feeling that Christian Hackenberg is going to torch this defense. He has enough time to get some throws off and they're going to break a tackle there, but that's not the type of game that they're looking for. He's going to be taking off. And with that sack, I don't even think everybody's going to get back to the line in time. So it went to overtime and the Nittany Lions have struggled here too. On third and 17, they're going to pick it up though. And of course it was Allen Robinson who came down with that ball. And on this next one, he's going to fight his way in. Oklahoma State is going to have no choice but to respond back. Clint Shelf on the read option is going to break free. He might be able to reach the end zone here, but even though he wasn't, his team is still in a very good position and it's tied again. On their next possession, they are on a third and goal, so they need to get in or else they're going to end up taking three, and they do so. But I'm sure that Penn State will end up responding back, and this is the game that'll never end. Well, now it's the drive where if they score a touchdown, they have to start going for two-point conversions, but it's third and 20, and once again, they're going to get close to picking it up. But this time, Allen Robinson couldn't pull it off, so they have to settle for three. All Oklahoma State needs is one touchdown, and they're going to be onto the Sweet 16. Charlie Moore catches another ball. He's been a sneaky athletic player for them, and I swear he's caught like 10 slants ever since I started watching on second and goal. He'll come away with another, but he couldn't find his way in, so it is third down. They're going with the pass on the one-yard line like a Pete Carroll call, and it's over. I don't know how you missed the throw that bad, but this game might never end. And on Oklahoma State's next drive, they got held to three again, so Penn State is looking to end it, and on second and goal, they're going to do it. Allen Robinson has the game-winning touchdown grab, and Christian Hackenberg moves his team on, where they'll be playing against North Carolina in the Sweet 16. First, we still have six other round of 32 games left, though, and San Jose State is the last team remaining in the Mountain West. I honestly didn't think they had it in
in them, but they have a lead and they're going to go up by 10 with two minutes remaining. This pit offense has Tom Savage, James Conner, Tyler Boyd, and many other studs on it, so I can't believe they've only scored 14. But if they don't start moving the ball quick, they're going to find themselves out of the tournament, and that's a bad sack. Tom Savage just couldn't get the ball out, so here on fourth and 16, he needs to at least do it here, and he misses the throw. So San Jose State's going on to the Sweet 16, and they'll be matched against whoever wins this. After how they won their first game, Syracuse was my sneaky pick to make an underdog run, but they're stuck on a fourth and 14, already down 11. It's pretty much over. And in the end, unless they can score 18 points in 43 seconds, they're done for, and this confirms it. There are only four more spots left in the Sweet 16, and Texas A&M is going to be one of them, as Johnny Mansell had himself another fantastic performance, even though his defense stunk. He rushed for over 100 yards and only had four incompletions, so I doubt UCF or USC really want to face him in the next round, but either team could make it there, and home field advantage will probably dictate that. The Trojans certainly got lucky with that draw, and they have a lead, but Blake Bortles wants to lead his team to a comeback. Since Storm Johnson can't hit a hole, he'll have to do it on another play, and he still can't get in. So it is fourth and goal, and they're going to drop back, and it's going to work out. With the game on the line, your best bet is probably to put the ball in the hands of Blake Bortles, and I didn't realize Brashad Perryman was also on this team. Now, I doubt their defense is as stacked as their offense, but UCF needs a third down stop, and they're not going to get it. So there's a decent chance that they'll never see the ball again unless they really step it up, and another big run has been given away. It all comes down to this final third and four, where Silas Red has a huge hole to just gash through, and USC will face off against Johnny Manziel in the next round. One of our final two games before then isn't very notable, but I just realized Utah State is another Mountain West team still remaining, and they did not show up to play against Vanderbilt today, as it's not even close. They'll be awaiting the result of Washington and Wisconsin, and I gotta say, this is a pretty even matchup. However, the Huskies offense has been pretty terrible, and on fourth and eight, they're gonna score a touchdown, but they're still quite a ways away from coming back, and on third and six, Wisconsin's gonna go ahead and pick it up, and from there, they would just feed Melvin Gordon, as they can't make a tackle on him, and he'd run out the rest of the clock. Here you can see a full look of the Sweet 16 bracket, and we're kicking it off with the Iron Bowl, so we all know how important this coin flip is for home field advantage, and it's gonna be Auburn's. I doubt it's gonna end as well as the kick six did, but it'll still be a good one, and with 56 seconds remaining, Auburn has the ball trailing by six. Nick Marshall is already throwing it up, and it was almost a pick, but since it wasn't, the Tigers' hopes remain alive, and on this play, a lot of time in the pocket. Again, he can't get the throw out, so it's fourth and 17. The clock has been ticking down under 25 seconds now. He's gonna throw it in the flat to Trey Mason, and Alabama has earned the first spot in the Elite Eight. TJ Yeldon ended up winning player of the game, and Duke did beat Clemson, so can they take down Florida State as well? They won the toss, so they get to be the host, and with three minutes remaining, they are up by five on Florida State and about to score again. What is going on? Anthony Boone, a guy I've never heard about, is leading this team to victory, and they're not even gonna get in, but that also means it is gonna be third and inches, and on the pitch, they're running back. Juwan Thompson will fight his way into the end zone. That is massive, as it looked like he was about to be stopped there, and Jameis Winston is gonna get this throw out, but it's going to be knocked away. So his four interceptions have come back to bite him, and on this check down on fourth and 10, they're actually gonna get it. And I applaud Devontae Freeman for the effort there, but they still need to get 12 points, so they're gonna need a lot more of those, and he's fighting. But since they've already burned one of their timeouts, they're gonna have to recover an onside kick, even if they get in. And it's due to happen, since we haven't seen one recovered yet in this video, but the odds aren't great. I just can't believe that Jameis Winston has thrown four interceptions. This is pre-NFL him, but on the onside kick, Duke is going to recover it, and that is yet another win. In fact, I think they've recovered an onside kick in every game that they've won, and evidently, I need to get to know the name Anthony Boone. He's now taken down the two best ACC schools, and I'm hoping Georgia can take down the third best one, Louisville, but we'll see. They were fortunate enough to not have to travel for this one, but with a few minutes left, Teddy Bridgewater and the Louisville offense have a six-point lead, and no matter what happens here, they're going to be going up by two possessions. They even got the two-point conversion, so Aaron Murray's going to have to move his team down the field here quick. He's going to find Todd Gurley for about a 10-yard gain, but they've already burned one of their timeouts, so to have the best chance at potentially coming back, they probably need to score in the next 30 seconds, and it might actually be possible. The Bulldogs are flying down the field, and they're going to pick up yet another first down, so it is not over, and this is about to get really interesting. If he can get this throw out, he does. It's still going to be in bounds, and that was Chris Conley that came down with it. He probably should have just let it hit the ground, but because he didn't, the clock's been running, and Todd Gurley gets in, but unless they recover this onside kick, it's pretty much over, and Louisville holds on to it. They could technically get it back with about five or 10 seconds left if they got all three stops, but even then their odds are so slim and it's not going to happen anyways. Dominique Brown had a fantastic performance and Teddy Bridgewater's team's going to be going on to the lead eight. As for LSU and Missouri, it's actually pretty even on paper, but it's going to be at Tiger Stadium. And evidently that doesn't mean much as Missouri has a lead. Odell Beckham's going to catch a touchdown, but they're still going to be trailing the Tigers. So they need to rely on their defense. If they can force a three and out, the game is not over. And I'm surprised that Missouri isn't running the ball. They just want to pass. But that decision doesn't seem to make much sense to me. 
there's the run and i'd expect to see that two more times this one's going to the right side and nobody's over there it's pretty much over i thought this lsu team might go all the way but evidently they were not as good as i was thinking and james franklin once again gets the job completed half of the spots in the elite eight are already taken and i don't know who's the better team between north carolina and penn state but i'm pretty sure the nittany lines have gotten the home field advantage every game so they've been very lucky in that regard here on third and ten they're not going to pick it up though so north carolina has the ball with under two minutes remaining and tj logan's going to come down with it which is almost game changing originally they were just trying to kill the clock but now they're feeding it to eric ebron and the odds are in their favor to go down the field and kick the game winning field goal i mean they're not seeming to have any issues moving the ball and penn state sent the cornerback blitz but it didn't get in in time so brian renner might actually be able to get his team a huge win tj logan has also been a big part of this and i'd say they're probably only about five to ten yards away from field goal range which they're going to definitely make in fact at this point they're just running down the clock so they can kick the game winner and they are leaving penn state a sliver of time but unless their quarterback christian hackenberg can chuck it 80 yards it's not going to make much of a difference that ball is going to be knocked away and we need to put some respect on brian renner's name if i showed you these final five teams remaining so far you'd think this was a basketball bracket and that makes almost no sense to me but this is actually a rivalry game so i'm very confused as to why with two minutes remaining trailing by 14 san jose state is punting the ball back to stanford and pretty much just giving up on winning they put up a very good fight in this game but in the end they didn't want it more and i'm ready for texas a&m versus usc if i'm being completely honest i'd love to see money manzel do well in this and mike evans also used to be one of my favorite players he was always a fantasy football machine for me so i'm glad to say texas a&m is up by 14 and if johnny manzel can end up finishing this drive off i think we all know who's gonna win and no matter what happens here the aggies are gonna go up by three possessions so even though the trojans scored a touchdown their hope of winning is pretty much non-existent hang on i know they're still down by 10 but we just witnessed the first onside kick recovery of this video and i don't think usc has what it takes to come back but i told you all it was possible to recover those nelson aguilar also just made it very interesting and will they get their second onside kick recovery in a row they will not it is actually held on to and i'm sure johnny manziel is relieved he'll be facing off against the winner of this last sweet 16 matchup and if wisconsin wins i think that's going to be a tough game their rushing attack has been very hard for most teams to stop but vanderbilt seems to have a solution and since they're trailing by four that drop touchdown could come back to bite them but it won't they just went up by three and the badgers are gonna need to respond back their quarterback has plenty of time back there but joel stave is not normally the one that runs this offense he's used to handing it off so with a minute and a half remaining it'll be interesting to see how wisconsin handles this they're letting him continue to sling it and i thought we'd see some halfback screens or dump offs but that's yet to happen until this play i literally called it james white will not go for the distance though and the badgers are playing this very aggressive they are not sending their field goal unit out there they want to go for the touchdown and with a minute left inside the red zone now they can go back to their bread and butter running the ball with melvin gordon he just took that one to the house with ease and now vanderbilt's trailing by four with 37 seconds left their quarterback somehow didn't get taken down there he gets the first down he fumbles it and wisconsin was the one that came up with it he tried to make the play of the game but he just got rocked from multiple angles at once and that is going to be it i mean i'll continue to watch it just in case they get three defensive stops with their timeouts but that isn't what happens and james white definitely deserved player of the game i will give props to vanderbilt for doing better than we thought they would but they didn't have what it takes to make it to the elite eight and now we're gonna see duke at home they've pulled off two crazy upsets so a third is technically possible but it turns out that was wishful thinking as they finally run out of luck and i don't want to diss on anthony boone but he did get exposed by this crimson tide defense tj yeldon also carried most of the load for alabama and they'll be waiting to see who comes out on top of the louisville missouri game at this point any of the final matchups could go either way and missouri won their last one on the road at lsu so i figured they'd be very competitive in this and probably win but louisville has a 13 point lead with three minutes left and i personally hope that they choke it but that's going to be very hard for the tigers to pull off they need to get in and i don't know why james franklin looks so slow on that scramble but he almost throws an interception and all they really needed to do was hand the ball off but they went with three straight passes needing one yard and he actually gets this that puts a lot of pressure on teddy bridgewater and the cardinal offense to get first downs they get one here and eli rogers came down with that last one they went with the wide receiver screen i was not expecting it and it worked but he stepped out of bounds so it really didn't matter if louisville gets a first down it is all over and what was that whiff tackle animation i don't know what number seven was doing here but he just completely missed the ball carrier and here on third and four it will all come down to this one final play where missouri's defense is not going to get the stop louisville will play alabama in the final four and on the other side of the bracket north carolina and stanford will be facing off i was a little surprised the tar heels took down penn state in their last one but evidently that was just a fluke as the cardinal have blown them out 40 to 13 is embarrassing and tyler gaffney rushed the ball 49 times for 207 yards he put his team on his back to get to the final four and their opponent 
is either going to be Texas A&M or Wisconsin. Johnny Manziel is going to get the home field advantage. And once again, it is not a close game as Texas A&M has just taken care of business. He's trucking a guy and the Badgers would need a miracle to come back from this deficit. Even though they've gotten it all the way down the field, they still need to do it two more times if they're able to score. And this sums up their luck today. He ran out of the end zone instead of staying in. And I'm really hoping for some magic just to make the video better, which might happen. This is why I try to make sure that I don't send many plays. What is that play called? That was literally so terrible. And with about 20 seconds left, why would Wisconsin's head coach think that was the right thing to do? I wanted a last second miracle, but it's not going to happen. And Johnny Manziel has earned his spot in the final four. There weren't any deep underdog runs, but that means these final few should be perfect. And as long as they're close, I will be happy at home. It's going to be Alabama. And honestly, I couldn't tell you which team I'd rather lose this. I don't like either of them. And up to this point, Teddy Bridgewater has struggled. He finally gets about a 25 yard gain with this play, but they're still going into the third quarter down 14. And for the Cardinals to stay in this, they need to finish this drive. If they're not able to crack their way into the end zone, I'd say it's pretty much game over. And on third and three, it looks like they have the tight end in motion and Teddy actually threw it his way. I was not expecting him to make that read. They're handing it off on fourth and one. And with the Alabama defense coming up very clutch there, I'd say it's pretty much over. TJ Yeldon picks this up and I can't even fault Louisville for not being able to stop the run. This running back core is insane. Derrick Henry, Kenyon Drake, and TJ Yeldon are all very good and they've gotten Alabama a spot in the championship because of stats like this. The real question will be which of these other teams has a real chance at beating the Crimson Tide and whoever it is, I'll be rooting for them because I am a big hater. I only dislike them because they've been so dominant and great for like my entire life and I'm sure people feel the same way about Kentucky basketball at least until recent years but I'll always respect Nick Saban and what he's done there. Let's go ahead and focus on this game and with a four point lead, Texas A&M is probably best off just milking some of the clock as they keep running but for whatever reason, Money Manziel is in hurry up mode and on this play, he's gonna find his running back for another first down. Stanford desperately needs a goal line stop but they're not gonna get it and with three minutes remaining, I'm not gonna count them out yet but they need to get points on this drive. They're stuck on another third down, they need to get 10 yards here and Kevin Hogan's gonna get the ball out just in time to find a wide open wide receiver so they're staying alive for now. I'm impressed that he was able to deliver even under pressure. He has so much time back there and luckily they'd get 14 yards after that but they need to pick up this third down and Kajusti luckily came down with it. Time is not on their side though so they need to stay in hurry up mode and that blitz came in so quick but the Cardinal didn't make the mistake of burning a timeout yet. I would hope they wouldn't but the AI does dumb things and Hogan is not on the field right now so their backup quarterback is in. What is he gonna do? He throws it and I don't know what Evan Crower was thinking but that was not open. He has to make a play on fourth and eight. He zips it over the middle. That's a touchdown and Ty Montgomery comes down with that one. I'm a bit surprised by their choice to go for the onside kick but they wanted to take their chances on it and they have all three timeouts so they can stop the run but it will not be easy. Johnny Manziel could always keep it. They're gonna hand this one off. That's gonna be a first down and in the end we're gonna get Texas A&M versus Bama. Johnny Manziel is gonna try to win a championship and we have come a long way to get to this point which is why I think it's best to make this a neutral site game in the Rose Bowl. Alabama has a slight edge on paper but their quarterback is AJ McCarron not Johnny Manziel so that's also a slight disadvantage even though he's taken off. In fact he'd find Amari Cooper for a touchdown on his first drive and on his second drive he finds OJ Howard but he won't make it to the marker so Alabama will be forced to settle for three. Johnny Manziel cannot afford to have another three and out here though. He has a lot of time back there and he throws it over the middle. He finds an open receiver and that is massive for Texas A&M as they're in hurry up mode now and I don't know if they're going to get stopped. Once he completes one pass they never slow down. They stay in hurry up mode. Mike Evans holds on to this ball but he ended up stepping out of bounds and for such a good receiver this was one of the worst routes I have ever seen. That one penalty might have killed this drive. It is third and ten. Johnny Manziel throws it up. Mike Evans holds on to the ball and I'd say they're right back in it but AJ McCarron has wasted no time getting his team down the field so there's a good chance they could fall back down by 10 so quickly. The defense is only an 85 overall and I figured they'd struggle against the Crimson Tide. They are so much better than them but that is a huge stop and back-to-back -back drives where they have held the Crimson Tide to a field goal could go a long way on this third and seven for Texas A&M. They are going to barely get it and ever since then the Aggies have been in full hurry up mode. They are not slowing down but I feel like that has to backfire at some point as the offensive linemen will get tired. Darrell Walker is somehow smoothly getting through everybody and with two minutes left in the first half the Aggies are in the red zone. They're getting down to the 10 and if they finish this drive off they're going to be taking the lead. Johnny Manziel keeps it and we have ourselves a great game. This third and four could really set the tone if Texas A&M could get a stop here and they're going to be able to do so. That means they had to punt the ball back to Johnny Manziel with a minute left in the half and he'll probably go to work. Where is he running? He went backwards. I mean I know he normally did that in real life sometimes as well but he also would end up on the other side of the field with his amazing speed. Look at that. He fought for so many yards and I normally don't like spectating entire NCAA football games on 14 because of the engine but this one is so much fun to watch. I never know what Johnny Manziel is going to do.
do whether that's run backwards, run forwards, chuck it up. And I thought he would get Texas A&M into field goal range, but he keeps taking sacks. I guess it'll all come down to this third and 16 where he needs to finally throw the ball. That is not going to get far enough. And instead of sending the field goal unit out there, they have Mike Evans in the end zone who is going to not come down with it. That is the first turnover of the game. And going into halftime, the Aggies are only up by one. They get ball to start the third quarter, but for some reason that turnover seems to be in Johnny Manziel's head. And even though both of these offenses are 99 overalls, it seems to be turning into a defensive battle. There's no way that that throw just actually worked. And I have to say, AJ McCarron has also been very enjoyable to watch. I don't know how he's pulling off some of these plays, but he continues to find Amari Cooper. And for some reason, Christian Jones is wide open. I figured they'd end up going for two and they went with the pass, which did not work for them. And midway through the third quarter, this feels like a drive where Texas A&M needs to get points and he just got the first. That was an amazing effort by the running back. Now they're going back to him and it almost got picked. But even though it was dropped, it still forced Texas A&M to punt it. And now Alabama could go up by two possessions. They've made it inside the red zone where they've had 100% efficiency so far. So we can safely assume that they're probably going to get on the board. But if they only get three points, it's a one possession game. That makes this third and 12 so important for the Aggie defense. And AJ McCarron is going to throw it off of his back foot. It is going to be intercepted and it is going to be taken away by Texas A&M. All I wanted was this to be a great game. Johnny Manziel has a chance to take a lead now. He needs to make sure he slides though. And if he doesn't, he might lose the ball again. He's going to try to take off and get sacked. So this might turn into an embarrassing three and out. And that is what you don't want to see. He is going to throw this one deep to assuming Mike Evans and Mike Evans does not come down with it on the Moss. He made the decision to try to throw it up to the big guy and Alabama was ready for it. They stopped him, but there's still three minutes remaining. And if they could get a stop on third and seven, that would flip the script. It's going to be thrown out of bounds and Johnny Manziel is going to get himself another chance. I hate to say it, but he's been incredibly disappointing this entire second half. And I feel like they haven't even moved the ball past midfield since that last drive to end the first. I just don't understand. He went from lighting them up to not even being able to get 10 yards on a run. And there's a great throw. So maybe he is starting to come alive. There was a lot of zip on that ball. And there is a lot of zip on that one as well. Mike Evans going to break the tackle. I think he was out of bounds, but it turns out this time he learned his lesson and made sure to stay in. So the Aggies could come away with the touchdown here. They only need about 15 to 20 more yards, but that was a rare missed throw from Johnny Manziel and he might end up regretting it if they don't score. The option definitely put them in a better position though. And they went with it again for the first down and more. So the Aggies are back in the lead and on the two point conversion, they're going to get it. Apparently Ricky Seals Jones was also a part of this team. And with a minute 17 left, AJ McCarron has the ball in his hands. Will he be able to lead his team down the field on an amazing drive? If he continues to look in Amari Cooper's direction, I'd say probably so. Another big catch here. And depending on how this goes, we might end up seeing overtime. He has a lot of time back there in the pocket. He heaves it up and it is going to be knocked away. But if that was held on to, Texas A&M could have won it all. They just missed a huge opportunity there. And we know for a fact that the Alabama kicker does not have the leg to make it from here because of the kick six. So that was crucial for them to pick up. It is first and 10 again. Kenyon Drake's going to hold on to this one for about eight yards. And so much could still happen in these final 24 seconds. Who knows what will. They get the first. And OJ Howard was able to hold on to it. On this next play, they're going to take the check down OJ Howard again. And now there's only a little bit of time remaining. They're going to go ahead and probably spike it. But somebody had a false start. And because of that, it's best if we just go on to overtime. Honestly, anybody could win it at this point. So who knows what will happen. And this is the perfect way to end the video. So I'm happy it all comes down to this. And Omari Cooper has been amazing. He's been force fed the ball, but every single time he holds on to it. And AJ McCarron sailed that pass here on second down. He almost didn't get the throw out. And I thought it was about to be intercepted off of the bounce. That would have been crushing. They're going to get a touchdown though. And nobody is surprised that it was Amari Cooper that ended up coming down with it. The Texas A&M defense doesn't seem to understand the concept of putting more than one guy on him. But Johnny Manziel has now come to a third and eight. And on this play, he's not going to get it out. So it's fourth and 16. We need to see some magic from him. Money Manziel is going to sling it. And that's a touchdown. Of course, he ends up finding somebody open. And I'm convinced that at this point, we are never going to see the end of the game. He throws another laser. And this time it was Mike Evans who caught it. If Alabama can score on this drive, we're going to start trading two point conversions. But that's only after teams score touchdowns. I don't know why they changed the rule to what it is right now, but I don't like it. And what a play. For some reason, for the first four quarters, the defense just showed up the entire time. But now that we've gotten overtime, it feels like it's disappeared. And that's a couple big stops. I don't understand why Alabama is being so passive, but it's third and 15. And of course, they're going to convert it. This game might never end. And it could make this video like an hour long, but I'm okay with that. Amari Cooper comes down with another touchdown. And on this two point conversion, AJ McCarron finds OJ Howard, but he is going to get stopped short. Johnny Manziel has his chance to win it all. He just needs a touchdown. He's going to find Mike Evans and he could win it for Texas A&M on this play. He's going to throw it and he's not in. This is the game that never wants to end, but at least they're scoring touchdowns.
rebounds fast now on this halfback screen they're gonna go for a big game and at this point I have run out of things to say as an announcer there's only so many sayings I have left in the tank this is gonna go to the five and of course Texas A&M has stayed in hurry up mode they are applying a ton of pressure right now getting down to the two so I'm sure they're gonna punch it in but the real question is do they have a better two-point conversion play planned I mean if they don't get this all of that is pretty much for nothing Johnny Manziel has a lot of time he takes off he runs it in and now it's AJ McCarron's turn to make a difference he's gonna throw it over the middle of course it's gonna already be a touchdown and what are the odds that they get the two-point conversion as well the handoff is gonna go for it and TJ Yeldon gets in I just don't see this game ever ending it reminds me of Texas A&M versus LSU but after an odd second and 10 play it is third and 12 and Alabama is gonna fall a little bit short on fourth and one they are opting into just taking a field goal here and that is such a weird decision I can't believe they are betting on stopping Johnny Manziel I know he had some rough moments earlier on but he has been killing it recently and can someone explain to me why Mike Evans just went for the one-handed grab here they're probably going to be forced to just settle for three unless they pick up this third and ten we're going to go into another overtime but the halfback screen is going to go the distance and he might make it all the way I thought we were going to go to another overtime but it could be all over very soon Johnny Manziel is going to miss his receiver and I don't understand how they're making so many mistakes now he's going to take off and that is it Texas A&M has won in walk-off fashion and with the stat line Johnny Manziel just put up he deserves this I mean he had seven total touchdowns and over 400 yards so on the throwback rosters in the 126 team tournament Texas A&M are your national champions.